As many of you know, uh, I've shared before, I lived in New Jersey for a period of time, and while I lived in New Jersey was when Hurricane Sandy hit. Right where we lived, we experienced uh, some damage, but we went to Staten Island and to, to help out. And uh, one of the vivid pictures I remember were these boats just piled on top of each other, just toppled like, like dominoes, like, like someone literally just picked these boats up and put them on top of one another. The other amazing thing was, was when you walked down the street, you would see houses with everybody's first floor just thrown on the front street. This is the picture I literally took on my probably iPhone 7 of the, at the time. I'm not sure. Maybe one of your iPhone people can help me out with whatever iPhone came out in the year of Hurricane Sandy. Picture quality, not great. But imagine this. Every, every house within a, a mile and a half radius of the water had the first floor of their house on the front. There was one family in particular that we went to help, and all we did was we gutted the first floor of their house. Again, literal picture I took on my phone, a little blurry, camera quality not great, but you can get it. I asked this family, tell me your story, what happened? They said that evening they went to, they went to sleep hoping that the storm wouldn't have much of an impact, yeah, they heard the wind, but were totally unaware when they woke up in the morning, they got to the top of their steps only to see water on the second step down. The whole first floor of their house had to be taken out. Imagine that. Maybe you've experienced something like that in, in another way. Well, throughout this series, we've been asking the question, what does it take to rebuild? What's it take? When I looked at this damage, and I saw this firsthand with my eyes, I'd ask myself the question, where do we even start? What do you, what do, you do? What is it that you would do to possibly even begin to rebuild? I mean, we weren't even rebuilding. We were literally gutting so they could rebuild. Can you imagine that? Take everything on your first floor of your house, just throw it on the street, and start over. Imagine that. Well, through this series, just a, a quick recap. We talked about to rebuild in the first time. We talked about that hearts have to be moved. God has to move someone's heart to rebuild. Now, sometimes rebuilding isn't a choice, but we can choose how we go through the process of rebuilding our lives. A couple weeks ago, we talked about we have to lay a foundation when we build. That was actually last week. We have to lay a foundation, right? Good foundation to build on. We talked about this idea that our foundation is prayer, but it's prayer and something else. Prayer and repentance. Prayer and God's Word. Prayer and action together. Today we're going to see, now where do we start building? The foundation is laid. We've maybe gutted, things have been torn down. Where do we start? And that's where we're going to see today where we start. And we're going to begin in Ezra chapter 3 this morning. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me there or a tablet. If not, it'll be up on the screen behind me as always. In this part, in Ezra chapter 2, it talks about everybody who was going back to Jerusalem to rebuild. Again, if you need more context, you can go back to the beginning uh, sermon on this. You can go watch it on YouTube uh, in, in our playlist of the We Will Rebuild playlist. But they're going back to Jerusalem to rebuild. It talked about in Ezra chapter 2, which we're actually going to go back to next week, about all the people that came to go rebuild. And Ezra chapter 3 picks up like this. It says, In early autumn, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled in Jerusalem with a unified purpose. We're going to get to that more next week. Think about the power of that statement right there. Then Jeshua, son of Jezedek, joined his fellow priest and the guy we've talked about before, Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, with his family, in rebuilding the altar of God of Israel. They wanted to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, as instructed in the law of Moses, the man of God. Verse 3 says, Even though the people were afraid of the local residents, they rebuilt the altar at its old site. They began to sacrifice burnt offerings on the altar to the Lord each morning. The first thing they did was, before walls went up, before the, 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 the parameters were laid, before the architecture got in there to do his drawings, before the engineer made sure that the, the plan they had was structurally safe, 
They rebuilt an altar. Rebuilding our lives always begins with God. Rebuilding your life always begins with God. And today, for whatever reason you're here, maybe you've had a relationship with Jesus for a long time, and you're like, yeah, I get that. Maybe today you're curious, or you're checking it out, or a friend invited you here this morning, or you just happen to jump in online. If you're looking to make a change in your life, or looking to do something different that you know you need to make a change, rebuilding in our lives always begins with God. You see, it's interesting, this week I went to, I went to Google I know, I, find, I know you, you hear me say it often in my sermons, but I try to get my mind just thinking about things. And, and you know how many books there are about rebuilding your life out there? Like, for instance, how to build a life at any age, starting over. Or starting over, building a new life. Or simply starting over your life beyond regrets. There's millions and millions of things out there that will give you some type of advice or maybe a step-by-step plan to change your life or to rebuild your life. The resources are endless. But the truth of it is, it's simple. Rebuilding our lives begins with God. And with this altar, even though they couldn't have a temple yet, they could still worship. This is what was vitally important to their lives. The altar was the way that they would have their relationship with God. If you're not familiar with what an altar is, here's a a rendering. Their altar might not have looked like this, but this was a rendition of an Old Testament altar. And what would take place is that they would bring animals to this altar to slaughter them and then burn them as an offering to God. Part of it was symbolic that when uh, flesh burns, it what? Stanks which is the reminder that our sin is, is gross in God's sight. The things that we've done to turn from Him, the things that we've done that don't line up with God, the brokenness of this world stinks. You know how much that the, the, um, the wet, gross first level of someone's house smells like? You think it smells good? Rotting sheetrock and wet furniture. That had, you could tell that they had a dog stinks. And so this altar was something where people would come in the Old Testament to give over to God. In the temple system, they would transfer this uh, animal to the priest. And it was like the transferring of sins was taken from this person, and the transferring of sins was put onto the animal. And then they would make their way into God's presence. But an altar is a grand reminder that we have a God who wants nothing more than to dwell with humanity, one theologian says. It's a way forward in repaired relationship. Atoning sacrifices ultimately reveal God's grace toward toward mankind. God wants to be in relationship with people. This really is the heart of what the, the Christian life is all about. That because of the fall, because of the broken world we live in, we have a broken relationship with God. Something has to make it right. So when, when Zerubbabel gets to Jerusalem, the first thing they do is feet on the ground, build an altar. Think about that. Some of us would probably be like, you know what? I'm building an outhouse. I'm going to make sure I have a clean place to go to the bathroom. Right? First thing I'm doing, I'm building a man cave. Right? I'm building my house. Listen, if I don't have, you know, accommodations... I'm not, I'm not going not gonna to be here to rebuild. Think about that. Maybe the first seven nights they just slept underneath the stars, but they made sure the altar of God was rebuilt in their life. Let's fast forward now to the book of Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 2, it simply can be summed up by a group of people saying, yes, let's go and rebuild the wall. So again, great reminder, Zerubbabel goes and he rebuilds the temple. Nehemiah now goes and he rebuilds the walls, that surround the temple. So when Nehemiah gets on the scene, they also too have an opportunity for the first build. And let's look at that in Nehemiah chapter 3. It says this, Then Elshelebib, the high priest, and the other priests started to rebuild at the sheep gate. Okay, we see right there clearly, 
started to rebuild the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors, building the wall as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated in the Tower of Peniel. People from the town of Jericho worked next to them, and beyond them was Zakir, son of Emirah. They started at the sheep gate. Here's a quick just kind of sketch of what this would possibly look like. Again, not so we can know history or to know our stats. You can see up here in the top, the sheep gate was where they started and where they went around to grab all these other pieces to this. So when I read, you're like, why would they start at the sheep gate? So they could have good dinners? Is that why? Like, anybody in here like lamb? Go to like Delmonico's and grab a lamb? Anybody? Anybody? Sure, right? A couple of you are lamb people. That's not what they were doing. I was like, oh man. I was like, we do the fourth Sunday meal here. Like, I thought maybe it was like reinforcement of that. The sheep gate is where the sheep would enter the place of sacrifice to the altar. They too in Nehemiah started in the place of sacrifice, started in the place of worship to God. It's the first thing they did. It's kind of odd if you think about it. You got a gate but no walls. Think about that for a moment. Don't you think you'd build the walls and then put the gate up? I don't know. I'm not a builder, but I don't know. It makes more sense. What, what would you do? If you walked up to a piece of property and it had one gate and no walls, you'd probably walk around the gate. You wouldn't even go, why would you walk through that? Makes sense. But they knew what was most important. They want to be, as they built the rest of the walls, they want to be reminded, it's why we're doing it. It's why we're doing it. When they built the temple, they could look at the altar and be like, why? We're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it because for God. You see, they began with the altar, they began with the sheepscape, because deep inside of them, deep inside of them, and deep inside of us, as Ecclesiastes would say, there's eternity planted in the human heart. And everybody knows, I don't know where you're at this morning, but everybody knows something's wrong in life. We all, we all could probably agree to that. That something is utterly wrong in our lives. We can look around us. We can watch the news. Probably something at work didn't go well this week. Relationships. All sorts of different things. Something's wrong. You hear cashier, talking to a cashier a couple weeks ago, they're like, this world's crazy. I said, I agree with you. You know, one of the things that, for me, when I was, we were driving down this long stretch in Staten Island, but it was nighttime, this picture kind of loosely represents this, but basically they took a front park uh, by the water, and you can kind of picture it, kind of like a, a scene from a movie, they pulled in those lights that they, kind of the, the, the rolling lights that you might see like on the highway as you're driving to light up this big field where they took everybody's first floor of their house and put it all together in one pile. I drove by that and I was like, my goodness. Like, what do you even do? But ultimately, that picture is a reminder of our lives. What do we even do? We, we, we've all experienced this brokenness. We've all experienced loss. We've all experienced heartache. We've all made choices that don't line up with God's choices for our life. We've all done it. We've all experienced it. That's what connects all of us here. And it's the reminder that we have a need for a Savior. Ultimately, the altar was a temporary thing that pointed to a need for a Savior. The sheepskate was a reminder that was a need for a Savior. Now, scholars will debate They'll say oftentimes when Jesus went and visited Jerusalem during his earthly ministry, he would walk through the sheep's gate even before it was time to be set upon the cross. See, it's Jesus. That's what all of this points to in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. It points to one that's permanent. We don't need to sacrifice animals anymore. We don't need to build gates anymore. Even this right here is just a reminder of, or that's a reminder of, this building, ultimately, is not what it's all about. It's about Jesus. Jesus connects this a little bit deeper 
in John chapter 10. He says this, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. He says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will be fine good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. He goes on in verse 11, and he goes, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Verse 14 says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me just as my father knows me, and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Jesus connects now the, why they build an altar, why they build this gate, because ultimately it was pointing of one to come in Jesus who is a permanent sacrifice for the sins of mankind. The permanent one that would, would, would come in and say, I'm the one who sets you free. I'm the one who heals your broken heart. I am the one that even though you may have troubles, take heart, I've overcome the world. I walk with you in your troubles. Today you may find yourself in two places. The first one might be you've never considered or taken that step of relationship with Jesus. Where do you start in rebuilding your life? It begins with Jesus. That's where it starts. You can try a lot of good things. You can buy a lot of great books on Amazon. In fact, there are so many books on Amazon, you probably could read them the rest of your life and not read all of them. But there's a person who God sent 2,000 years ago as a man to physically walk this earth to take every step of our life in our place, to, to live the life we couldn't live and die the death we deserved because we fall short of God's glory. He's perfect, the perfect lamb that was put upon and altered the cross for us. It's a new life. He doesn't just give us a ticket to heaven. Yes, it's eternal life with the Father in eternity, but it's also life today. Looking to rebuild your life, looking to make a change. It has to begin with Jesus. You can try a lot of good things, but it's not going to bring the joy and satisfaction that Jesus does in your life. Now, it's easy also, as a believer, to get stuck in a rut. It's a reminder. The altar was, again, they can look back on it and be like, this is why we're doing it. The sheep's gate is why we're doing it. The cross is a reminder of what it's all about. When you get stuck in a rut, when you're, when, you're, when you're maybe years into your Christian life and you're struggling or you're hopeless, it comes back to what Jesus has done for you. I remember, again, vividly, one evening we were down in Staten Island and we were in somebody's apartment. No power on that stretch of the island pastor we were with brought me in with these, this group of this family first floor gone what do you do the pastor was like let's just pray I remember in his prayer he was like helping us remind what Christ has done because we can have the best house you can have the best job you can have the best career you can have the most money but life without Jesus is nothing it's meaningless your life with Christ is what it's all about. And oftentimes, if you are a follower of Jesus, it's easy to lose that in the midst of all the stuff we go through. So we will rebuild is about the reminder of what do we keep coming back to? What do we focus our eyes on? Let me give us one more instance of the Old Testament pointing of what's to come. Joshua chapter 22 talks about a time and place where they were going to build an altar to remember something God had done. And they say this in Joshua 22, verse 26. It says, So we decided to build the altar, not for burnt sacrifices or offerings, but as a memorial. It reminded our descendants and your descendants that we too have the right to worship the Lord at His sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifice, and peace offerings. Then your descendants will not be able to say, ours, you have no claim to the Lord. Verse 28 says, if they say this, our descendants can reply. Look at this copy of the Lord that our ancestors made. It was not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. Let's read this together. It was what? It is a reminder of the relationship both of us have with the Lord. 
This cross is just wood. That one just has a nice LED display behind it. It's a reminder. We can, we can take these and tear them down. There's nothing, there's nothing holy about those. It's the reminder, though, of the one who is. It's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. We get stuck in life. We get bumps. We get bruised. We have to have something we go back to to say, this is what keeps us straight in life. This is what keeps us moving forward in life. This is what helps me keep going in the right direction in life because of what Jesus has done. So what does it take to rebuild Jesus and his finished work? Not something you can do. You don't gain this. You don't earn it by doing something great. This is the amazing thing about it. It's a free gift. Not by doing a bunch of good things, but ultimately by surrendering your life over to Christ, turning from your ways, seeking his forgiveness, walking in the way he's called you to walk. I want you to consider one question this morning because Jesus died and rose again for me, I don't have to blank anymore. What's that mean? You can keep that to yourself. Write that down. What does that mean in your life? Do we honestly believe that this is the greatest thing? When we walk in here and worship, can we worship in such a way? Or when we go through our days, do we walk through our days in such a way that our greatest need in life has been taken care of? that the greatest thing we've ever had to have has been taken care of. Christ dying in our place. Rising again, defeating the thing we hate, death. But also sending the gift of the Holy Spirit to give us life today. And life to the full, as John 10 says. Life abundantly, as he said. So what does it take to rebuild? Today, maybe it's the opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus. Jesus. Talk with someone who invited you here this morning. You can see me at some point. Talk to someone. Or today is the ultimately the reminder of what Christ has done.